Hey, how you doing? Happy Palm Sunday. Chris Pleckenpole here, lead pastor at Wells Branch Community Church. I am so glad that you guys are joining us from wherever you are joining us from, uh, from your living room, uh, from California or New York. Uh, we are so glad to involve the whole wide world, but especially if you're in Austin, Texas, we are so glad to have you here with us this morning. Uh, we are so grateful for what God is doing, even through a hard time. Now, remember, one of the things we want to encourage is questions. And so if you have any questions or comments, text us on the, there's a little number there on the below in your chat uh, comment section and just let us know any questions or comments you must have. All right, so we're in a time of coronavirus, all right? So we're even coming upon Easter and still things have not changed. We are sheltering in place and that makes me all the more grateful to have our church body. Um, um, I know for a lot of you, uh, you may be seeing uh, business associates and, and people like that, but for me, I get to see a lot of church people every day uh, through community group, through discipleship groups, through our elder meetings. Now, I don't get to do it in person. It's through a screen, kind of like, hey. And I, there's a sense of I want to kind of reach through the screen and touch you guys and give you like the, the virtual hug. Uh, but the reality is this is kind of where we're at, and I'm so grateful that I can share this burden uh, with those who I'm close to, the, the church. And if you're not in a community group, please uh, come talk to us. This might be the perfect time to join a virtual place where everybody's looking through a screen to find uh, friends and community and support during this time. But I do have a warning for you. All right, here's, here's the warning of all community that you need to be sort of wary about. If you get close to any of us, familiarity breeds contempt. I mean, we call ourselves a church family, right? And so here's the reality. If you have a healthy family, you're probably going to have a healthy relationship with the church. I'm just going to throw that out there. If you have a, if you're, you know, you, your, your family interacted really healthy all growing up, you didn't have any crazy dysfunction, then I'll bet you, you had a, you have, you're having a great experience with church. But what happens for those of us who didn't have a great upbringing, maybe there was divorce, uh, maybe there was abuse, maybe there was friction, maybe when someone got mad in your house, House, here's what they would do. They wouldn't tell you they're mad. They'd shut down. They'd walk away and give you a silent treatment for a week. And then, and then come out of nowhere acting like nothing happened. You're like, what? And so what has happened is maybe you've sort of internalized that thinking that's normal. And then you do that to other people and they're put off by that within the church. So of course, a church family is going to have issues. And so this morning, um, I want us to be a church that loves the church. And the primary reason for that is the church is the bride of Christ. And we should honor and love the bride of Christ who our Savior loves. And so that's sort of the heartbeat this morning. And I know that we resist loving the church because the church struggles with conflict, right? Um, it, here's, here's why I love this. Um, for those of you who, who've come to our church recently and you're like, finally, I'm at a church that does it right. I, whenever I hear that, I kind of go, oh no, they're not going to be here for long because eventually you're going to see in us that we don't do it right, right? Um, it's kind of like, you know, the, um, the, the engaged couple that says, we're not going to be like all the other couples who fight. And you kind of want to do this. You want to kind of pat them on the head and go, oh, that's so cute. You're so sweet. So if you're kind of that person when it comes to church, uh, the reality is um, you're eventually, if you get close to anyone, if you, if you kind of get close, there is going to be conflict. But how we handle that conflict is going to determine what kind of a church experience a lot of people are going to have, especially who have never had a family that they could call home and felt loved in. And then, okay. The second reason, or we resist loving the church when the church struggles, at fellowship. Um, we love fellowship. I mean, sharing, the word fellowship is really from the Greek word quantity, which is like the ultimate of sharing of everything. And in church, that's sort of what we do. We, we share stuff. We share our lives. We share our finances. We share struggles. We share burdens. And it's really great until someone takes advantage of you. And then you're not so excited about sharing. And the way they might take advantage of you is they don't say thank you. They don't, they, don't spend, uh, they don't spend time with you. They're too busy. All those things can kind of wrap up and we're like, I don't do church because those people, they don't have time for me. Okay. Or finally, um, 
we resist loving the church when this church struggles at the gospel. Um, Because even churches that are all about the the gospel need correction from time to time because we can get so excited about our programs. And we make the program the most important thing. And we want to boast about like this great thing that we've got going on. Or we can, uh, many churches struggle with politics and we want to bring politics into the church. But here's the thing, uh, church is inherently political because Jesus is king. Or, or what about this one? Uh, we bring economic situations. We bring just things in that are our preferences and we make them policy and we make them prominent in the church and we miss out on what, the, what Jesus wants the church to be all about, which is the gospel. Okay, so um, if you're new with us, if you haven't been with us before, uh, we're, we're talking or we're finishing up, uh, this is a 10th part of a 10-part series on the book of Galatians. And in the book of Galatians, uh, Paul is writing a defense. Chapters one and two talk about his defense of his apostleship and then his defense of his belief that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. In other words, this shirt is all about that, that Jesus came, he died, he rose, he ascended, and he's coming back. That is the message. Notice how there's no you in it. The only part of you in it is the believing part. And so then uh, from there, he said, because what the, the Galatian churches were saying is like, Paul, you left out all the stuff, we, all this Old Testament stuff that pointed to all the stuff we're supposed to be doing. It's great to believe in Jesus, but there's a big plus sign you need to put on there for all the stuff we're supposed to be doing. And so Paul goes back to chapter, uh, in chapter three, he goes back and says, salvation has always been uh, by grace through faith. And he points it through the lens of Abraham and Moses. And then he talks about what uh, in chapter four is heirs as God's children. So we're not slaves to the law. And then chapter five is all about the Christian faith freedom we have to live by the Spirit. And so this week we're going to get into God's just heartbeat for how the church is to love one another, not out of the spirit of works, but out of the spirit of freedom. So would you guys mind praying with me as we open up God's word to speak to us in a really, really relevant time when we need the church to be all the church is supposed to be and that God designed it to be. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are in in this story, that you're in this word of God. God, I'm so grateful that I, um, when I read this word that, that's been written thousands of years ago, it speaks right to me because it's relevant right now. So God, I'm praying for everyone listening, wherever they are listening from, that you would speak directly to them. And as they open up their Bible, as they open up uh, the word that you've given us, God, would, they, would you clearly give them conviction give them ability to see where the hearts got dark and give them the ability to see your grace and your mercy um, being poured out through people because it's all about the relationships that we have here on earth, reflecting the relationship we have with you, Jesus. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, thank you, amen. All right, verse, uh, chapter six really is preceded by chapter five and there's like one verse in there that I really think that's uninspiredly in the wrong chapter, and that's chapter or verse 26. So chapter 5, verse 26 is where I'm going to start. So go to chapter 6 in your Bible and go back one verse, and that's where we're going to start. And Paul writes, Let us not be conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill, so fulfill the law of Christ. Law of Christ here, uh, John 13, 34, uh, a new commandment that I give to you that you have love for one another. And then he goes on and says, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So love one another. Verse three, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast in himself will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. In other words, Christians, watch this, love the church restoratively. Now, you know who obviously the ultimate restorative person is Jesus. And I, I always go back to John 11 when I want to show people how it is we're supposed to minister to people in a time of grief or crisis or pain. John 11 paints the perfect picture. Here it is. You've got Jesus showing up to a funeral four days late. Lazarus is dead. Martha, um, one of the sisters of Lazarus, runs out and says, Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus is like, he's going to live again. And then Martha's like, yeah, I know he's going to live again in the resurrection at the end of time. He's like, 
I am the resurrection and the life. And then she's like, uh, and she kind of moves on. And so Jesus, in a sense, tells her off, right? And then, and then the next thing you know, he comes up to Mary, who runs out to Jesus saying the exact same thing. Jesus, you would have been here. My brother would not have died. And then when he looks at her and he sees her just distraughtness, he just weeps. John eleven thirty five, 35, shortest verse in the Bible. He loses it himself and he cries. Jesus meets Martha exactly where she needs to be met. Jesus meets Mary exactly the spot where she needs to be met. One is with like a sense of truth and reality. Another is a sense of tenderness, of deep love. And he loved them both equally. He loved them both the same. They were sisters, raised the same house. This goes for a parenting technique, right? Uh, He treats Martha different than he treats Mary. His response is different, although the love is the same. Now, this is why I say, just be like Jesus when it comes to conflict and you'll be fine. Well, okay, yeah, that's really hard to do, right? Because you're not Jesus. So Paul, he, he unveils for us how we're to do this, right? So watch, if you're not Jesus, this is how you're supposed to respond. There's two primary issues with restoration. Number one is conceit, and number two is comparison. All right, that's how, that's how so conceit, we see it in uh, chapter five, verse 26. Let's not become conceited. And then you see, watch, uh, verse three. Verse three sort of lets us know how we're supposed to do this. It says, bear, or he says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill, fulfill the law of Christ. That's verse two. Verse three, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So in other words, the way that you start out with not being conceited, you start viewing yourself as nothing. Now, I think this people get really sort of upset about this, but that's the spiritual one. You who are spiritual, the ones who don't think they're something, the ones that realize they're nothing, that is where you start from. That's how you get conceit out of this. Now, here's, here's what I think um, in a world of self-esteem and in a world where um, we want a healthy self-esteem, a sort of self-pride. Self, here's where people go, let, let's say, listen, in fact, the University of Texas uh, on their um, counseling and medical health or mental health uh, counseling website, they, they say this, look, they say, Unhealthy self-esteem will lead to anxiety, loneliness, depression, no friends, vulnerable to uh, alcohol and drug abuse, and, and impaired job performance. Now, Paul, the guy writing this, said, I am the worst of the worst. At one point, he says, I'm the worst of the apostles. At another point, I'm the worst of all Christians. At another point, I'm just the worst of everybody. I am the worst. I am nothing. And then you'd say, did he have a problem with friends? I mean, he had deep friendships. He did, wasn't He's the guy that says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and petition, supplication, present your requests to God. I mean, that's a guy that's in prison, kind of gets it. Maybe he's just a crisis Christian. He functions best in Christ. No, here's a guy that was able to pastor a church for two years at a time and, and love them and, and serve them. And this is the incredible blessing. So Paul was really functional. It wasn't that he had no self-esteem. He just had a Christ esteem. He believed, he understood how bad he was. He didn't, he, he just said, yeah, I am that bad, but Christ and God are that good. So that's the part where we need to start. That we start, when we come to a place of um, meeting with people in their point of crisis, even Jesus, Philippians 2, 7, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, born in the likeness of men. So we start with empathy, and that's really what I want. So empathy says, I, I am gonna jump into your nothingness with you because I am nothing as well. And then, watch this, I seek first to understand, then to be understood. That, that is what my first grader learns all the time, because Stephen Covey has, has like popularized this like unbelievably, and so every elementary school I've ever seen has like this thing of seek first to understand, then to be understood. But watch, you know where they got that from? It's, it's Proverbs 18, 13. He who speaks before listening is a fool in his folly. So we want to be a people who are listeners, we want to be a people who are empathetic, and then we're able to speak into somebody's Life. Now, the second thing of this is comparison. Look at verse um, four, and this is where it sort of gets confusing because you're like, you get confused. So let me explain it. But let each one test his own work. That word test there is um, checking out the, this is what it was primarily used for using it for the test, the genuineness of a, of a metal to see how sincere or pure it is. Let each one test his own work. In other words, what Christ is doing in you. And then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his his neighbor. In other words, don't look at the other guy and go, I ain't that bad. 
look at your own self and go like, oh yeah, I am that bad. I do need Jesus. And what can happen is when we start looking at others as with the I'm not that bad comparison motif, other people feel it and you come off as better than. And so at any moment you need to sort of say, listen, I'm just as broken as you are, right? So here it is, watch this. It's this thing of um, conceit, says, look at me. Comparison says, look at you. And Christ says, look at him. And I think that's where we need to wrap our head around. Let me, let me explain this in a story. Um, when I was in seminary, I was a little bit of a train wreck. Okay, I'd just gotten out of the military, coming out of combat, and I jumped right into seminary, and I had a little bit of issue um, with, with women. And I was inappropriate, uh, broke a lot of boundaries, purity, sin, the whole thing. And I, got, and I needed to be confronted, and I was. And I had two different people confront me. One was the chaplain of the seminary. And uh, he came up to me and we had like a 15 minute one-way conversation. You guys know how those go. And listen, that's how the military operated. This guy had been in the service. He knew I'd been in the service. And, uh, and I took it okay. Um, and he just kind of, you don't understand that you are going to be leading men and women. You, 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 what you do, Matt? And I'm like, bam, bam, bam. How could you? How dare you? Don't you understand? And I was like, man, I'm awful. I'm worthless. There's no hope for me. Jesus can't do anything with this mess. And it was like just a real sense of just deep, deep sadness um, that I was that bad and that Jesus couldn't do anything about it. And that was hard. But there was another one at the seminary, the, the seminary counselor who brought me into his office. He says, I'll never forget it. He's like, so tell me what happened. And I kind of went to the store and he goes, mm, that's so hard. And all of a sudden, I felt heard. And then he pointed me to Jesus. He didn't talk about himself. He didn't talk about anything of that. Like he had been through, he just said like, what what I want you to do is focus on what Jesus has done for you and understand that your heart is gonna be restored and you're in a process of being saved and there's some great things in store for you if you can yield to the Holy Spirit here. Changed my life. And I want you to see that's exactly when it comes to conflict because we're gonna have it. Listen, this might be helpful in your own family, right? Right? Because if your family is one of those families that sort of was like judgmental towards everybody and so now you're judgmental towards everybody, then what's going to happen is there's got to be this place where you sort of genuinely start to say, I understand what it feels like to judge someone. I want to judge you, but I can't because I've been saved by the same amount of grace that saved you. All right. So that's, that's where we start. Now, here's the thing that happens is, is that inevitably conflict is a product of fellowship, right? Because you don't have conflict with people you don't know. And that's where verse six is really going to get into Paul is going to say, well, here's how you deal with the fellowship aspect that's going to produce the conflict. Watch this. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are in the household of faith. Okay, so watch. Christians love the church by sowing good into one another. You got three goods in there. But before we get into the goods, I've got to address uh, the verse that sounds a little bit draconian and sort of anti-gospel, right? Like this, this one, right? God is not mocked for whatever one sows that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh from the flesh will reap corruption. But for the one who sows the spirit from, from the spirit will reap eternal life. So let me explain that. Uh, what Paul's doing here is he's kind of sharing just something that is a truth, just like gravity, all right? G- gr- like you, you can't mock God. You can't walk off a cliff, say, I can fly, and then beat gravity. It's just not gonna happen right? That, that's just a principle that is true. Now, watch this. When you sow negativity, friction, discord, pain into your relationships, what are you going to reap? Happiness, joy, and someone go, oh, thank you for pointing out all my flaws. No, no. What you're going to reap is more discord, more pain, more frustration, and friction, and maybe even anger and hatred. Okay, that's what you're breeding. That is just a fact of life because what you're doing, you're sowing to your own flesh because that's where your identity is. And so the life patterns sort of reveal that. I need someone to know how great I am. So I'm going to make sure they know how bad they are. 
Okay, well, isn't that true? Then, then, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So if you're a person who's sowing to the Spirit, like you're sowing good into people, love into people, you, you're, you're going there with them and you're wanting to encourage them, then you're going to what? What are you going to reap? Encouragement. You're going to reap wholeness. Uh, okay, so here are the three types of people that we need to be really sowing into. First are teachers. Now, when, when I talk about teachers, and anytime this verse is read, for the most part, I think we think about uh, pastors and supporting them financially, right? I mean, that's kind of like, and listen, I'm all for that, but that's not it. That's not the full picture. Um, I, I reached out to community group shepherds uh, this week. Community group shepherds are our community group leaders who shepherd, who do the pastoring of uh, their small groups, and I go, listen, um, Tell me some people who have thanked you. And uh, uh, one of those people was Tony Nelson. Uh, Tony and Jessica lead a community group on Friday nights. And they said, uh, you know, there's a couple that really thanked us a ton. That was uh, Tyler and Jody Scott. And I go, well, how did they think? He said, they made us feel, and they helped us to communicate to us how much they meant to us. They've served our family even beyond just showing up to group. Because don't you have a community group uh, shepherd? They go, hey, thanks for coming. When the community group shepherd set it up, got the child care, did all the things, and then they're thanking you for showing up. Anyway, that's, maybe that's a pet peeve I have. The, the, I mean, that's good that you're there. It's great. But the reality is it's thank you for putting this on. And Tyler and Joni went over and above to show them that. And then I asked Tyler and Joni, what did they do that made you so grateful? And they said they shared their lives with us. And here's the text they sent me. I'm just going to read it to you. Before they taught us about marriage, we didn't even like each other. We were so totally different. We didn't appreciate our differences. I didn't ask Joni about decisions. That's Tyler saying this. I just said we were doing this, and my wife didn't like me at all. We didn't have a budget. We didn't know where our money was going. We had no savings, and Joni was extremely stressed. Yeah, I can imagine. All right, they taught us to make a plan for our money, and now we have money and aren't stressed about what happens financially. We didn't care about the other people before Tony and Jessica. We didn't want it to be around people or help anyone. Church would be really great if it wasn't for the people, right? Okay. They taught us the greatest joy was giving to others. We were meant to help one another. We're not perfect in any of these things, but who knows how long it would have taken us to consider any of them uh, without them talking to us. And, and then they added this. We were going through a marriage book together. They didn't just let us read and then have commentary. They went alongside it with us and let us see the ugly parts of their life, which made us more willing to be honest with ours. And that was transformative to Joni and Tyler, and they were able to communicate that. And here, so, this, so obviously, we need to be thank. Listen, if you are in a community group and you've never said thank you to them, what, just text them right now. Why wait? And hopefully right now they're getting like, bing, 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 bing. Their, their phones are blowing up with uh, thanks because it's so valuable and important that we thank those who are preparing and spending time getting childcare together, getting a lesson together, providing a host home for all that. That's important. And now that we're in video conference world, it's a little different. I get it. But listen, listen, how valuable is it when you tell your teachers thank you, because that starts to develop. That starts to sow a seed into them that you value them, and then they start to go, oh, I'm valued. I'm going to pour more in. That's how that works. Um, the number two person we need to look at are those in the household of faith. Uh, Dave Sheffield and Kelly Sheffield are, um, Dave's an elder here, and they are an, an instrumental family in our church, and their oldest son, Aaron, um, got cancer. He was supposed to be going to Barcelona uh, this summer to study abroad. Instead, he got to study chemo and uh, just finished with that. And so praise God, we're praying for complete healing, complete protection for Aaron during this time. But uh, the community group that the Sheffields on Adam and, and Meredith Harrison, they love them, text them regularly, set up meal trains for them, made all that happen so that uh, a f this family in a moment of crisis felt loved, supported, and taken care of in all of their needs. And, and that is what community groups do. Okay, uh, third place, third place, third place do good is outside the body of Christ. And I, I really want to stress this because we're in a weird time uh, where people are in need. And so listen, uh, if you were to go to our, our website, wellsbranchchurch.com, and you're to you know, there's a, at the very top, there's a banner that says, click here to learn more about what we're doing for coronavirus. If there's anybody you know that is, is struggling financially, would you um, send them the application that can fill out online? 
or even just have them call us and we would love to partner with them in helping them through a really tough season because that's what the church does. Our church raised a lot of money last year and we had about $16,000 sitting in a fund ready to help those who are in need. And I want this money not to sit in our bank account, but be paying somebody's rent, somebody's groceries. And that's how we can be the church, love the church, invest in the community and the community will invest in us by learning what the true gospel is. Now, verse 11 is where Paul takes over the writing. Watch this. Verse 11 says, See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. In other words, bold this. I'm now taking over for the secretary. I was dictating, now I'm writing because this is really, really important. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Persecution comes with being a Christian, but if we can just say, hey, we're just like everybody else. We do good things. That's how you get to heaven. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. There's another notch in the belt. Look, got them to get circumcised. We're doing good. That's ridiculous. That's not the gospel. Okay, okay. far be it from me, and this I love, this is the heartbeat, and this is why Paul wanted to write this, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me. And I, the world, for neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. As for all who walk by this rule, that you're a new creation, that's what that rule is pointing to, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. That means the, the Jews who became legit believers. Verse 17, <clears throat> from now on, let no one cause me trouble for I bear my body the marks of Jesus. And here's the reality. You spend any time following Jesus, you're gonna bear in your body the marks of Jesus, especially in Christian leadership. And our shepherds and our elders and our pastors here know that they have gotten some scars and wounds from people uh, because they bear the marks of Jesus. Serving him isn't something that is um, easy. It's just a privilege for those who have been saved and it's the grace of God that we get to do it, but it comes with a cost. Verse 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Now watch. Christians love the church because Jesus died for the church. And the part that I wanted you to really kind of wrap your head is that far be it for me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus. Don't boast in politics. Don't boast in economics. Don't boast in programs. Don't boast in anything other than Jesus. And this is why it gets difficult. We don't wrap our head around why we love the church because we disassociate people from the word church. We somehow come up with institution. These institution produce these bad people. No, no, it's God saved uh, bad people. Not even that. God saved dead people and then made them alive, but they're still broken. And you're angry with people that God, that Jesus is working with and he died for. You're challenged by people who are still growing in their faith. I get it. They're a mess, but they're, Jesus loved them enough to save them. This is why this is important. Jesus didn't say, uh, a new command I give to you, love one another, and they will know you are my disciples if you have a really great children's program. They will know you're my disciples if you're really smart and you let everybody know. They will know you're my disciples if you're really witty and you can put people down like a champ. No, he said, you'll know my disciples if you have love for one another. And then he says, just as I've loved you, so you must love one another. Now, here's what Jesus did. Um, I, I was trying to think of why this just really matters for the church, and here it is. It's this, it's this one thought. <clears throat> because if it's, if it's Jesus plus all the good work I do, it's saying something like this. This is why you have to boast only what Jesus has done. Watch. Let's say your house catches on fire, and you had like one of those fireproof safes. Maybe you have a gun safe, and you stuck everything valuable, like computers and stuff, and then you do it every single night, and then you had like this incredible escape plan, and all your children and everyone sort of memorized, and you worked on it all the time, and then the fire came one night, and you're like, aha, and the, everything burns to the ground. Your fire safe is perfectly fine, uh, and all your kids make it out, and you're at like at the rally point, and then the, the fireman shows up, says, I'll save you, and he dashes in the fire and then dies a fiery death. You'd be like, you're an idiot, right? Like there, there, there's like, I had it all. You just like talk to me first. I, I had this under control. And I think that's the way a lot of us view Jesus. 
if you're not a Christian, you totally view Jesus like that. Like, listen, I'm, I'm my own salvation. I, I, can, I can get myself out of this jam. I'm, the fire's, there is no fire. There is, no, there is nothing that he needs to save me from. And so for him to go and die uh, for the sins of the world is ridiculous. And that's offensive to Christians. Because if the only hope I have is that Jesus went into the fire for me, and he saved me, and he gave me his spirit so that I could live, it becomes brand new. But if you think there is no sin, or if you're like, gosh, sick guy, so why are we so all about this sin stuff? Then Jesus, there's no read for, reason for Jesus to die. That's the part I need you to wrap your head around. There's no reason for Jesus to go to the cross if there is an issue with sin that's uh, going to lead us ultimately to a separation from God and death. And so that's why we get passionate about the gospel. And that's why we need church to be only about the gospel because when Jesus died, he died for a sinner saved by grace. Now watch this. If you're angry at somebody who Jesus died for, this is why Jesus is like, I love them enough to die. God sent his son. He sent his son to love that person enough to send his son for that person who you're angry with, who challenges you, who's super needy, who's always talking, who's running their mouth, and they need your love because they are in the family of God. And I don't want you to take your broken family traditions and bring them to church. I want you to learn how to be a new creation and to love people as God designed. That's what the church does. So my question to you right now is what barrier do you have to loving the church? <sighs> That's my question. What's the barrier? What's the broken spot? What's the part that you don't wrap your head around? And listen, if you're not a Christian, I get it. Um, at first, you need to come and just simply say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. And say, Holy Spirit, come into my life and make me the person you want me to be. And if you are a Christian this morning, my heart's cry for you is that you would totally put your whole faith, your whole heart uh, into what Jesus has done and not go back to the works of the flesh that goes and points to, it's all about me, or at least I'm not like you. That is broken. We come back and we have fellowship that looks out for the needs of one another, even when it's hard. And we have tough a conversation with people that shows them that they've maybe become codependent upon you. And that's a healthy place to be. That's how we have those conversations. We need to teach one another how to love one another because most of us had no idea what it was like to have a healthy family that knew how to love one another. In fact, I'd say pretty much everyone, even if you think you had a great family, there's some brokenness in it that Jesus needs to redeem and affects the relationship you have with people. So of course, the church can be challenging. But as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And if wounds from a friend can be trusted, but the enemy multiplies kisses, let us be a church that loves so deeply and so well. Let's pray. God, as we go into this time of communion and we just want to get our hearts right, Lord, if there's something we need to confess to you, um, will we just take this time, Father, before uh, coming to the Lord's Supper to really just prepare our hearts? Lord, there might be some stuff, someone in a room we need to confess to that we've been angry with or frustrated with. Another person in the room whom Jesus died for, but we're not loving them well. And God, I pray that your grace um, will be sufficient in this. That we be able to watch you work in us and through us. And so, Lord, as we go to this time of communion, we just kind of lay before you the darkness of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.